thank you, Titus. And as she mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how exercise affects our body. And what I really wanted to focus on a little during this presentation is some of the stuff that happens on the inside that's not really so obvious in the way that exercise actually confers some of the benefits that it does. And so really, I'm going to kind of walk you through step by step some of the organ systems that exercise functions and hopefully it will give you some benefits that don't really become that apparent just from when you see an, act, an athlete or someone like that out. Some of the changes that are more easy to visualize. So I'll walk you first through some of the things that happen to our bones after regular exercise. I'll talk about some of the adaptations that happen to our muscles. Also some of the stuff that happens to our fat tissue. And finally, some of the things that happen to our heart and vessels. To begin, I just want to give a few definitions that I'm going to refer to throughout the talk, hopefully to just provide some context, but I'm not really going to be focusing on many definitions besides this. And when I talk about exercise, I'm not just talking about marathon running or, or being an athlete. But I'll define two different types, the first being cardiovascular exercise. And these are the things like running, jogging, walking, climbing stairs, uh, things that require moving the body's large muscles for a sustained period of time, usually minutes or, or even hours. And then there's resistance exercise, which looks more like SpongeBob here trying to lift these teddy bears. It's actually pushing weights, whether it's on machines or with barbells or dumbbells that you might find in the gym. And this is really pushing against acute resistance, and why we call resistance exercise. And then the, the other thing I wanted to do to try to paint some of the perspective of my talk is that exercise isn't really limited to athletes like I mentioned before. And there's some really interesting studies that show that the benefits of exercise can reach people even very late in life. Uh, so I'll talk about one study that shows they took a group of 147 year olds, just that you might find on the street anywhere, and made them do a couple things, one of four things, uh, for a period of six months. First, they looked at people that did just nothing. These are, they went about the normal lives, didn't change anything different. They also told some people to do cardiovascular exercise. These were things like stair climbing uh, and cycling. They had another group of, of these seven-year-olds do resistance exercise. These were things like lifting weights in the gym or a combination of the two. And then, in these adults, they wanted to see how this exercise actually improved their daily function. Things like being able to walk to the grocery store by themselves. And they measured it in ways like, how many blocks can you walk in five minutes, for example? And for the people that did nothing, you'd expect no real improvement. This is just them going about the normal daily life. But when you have people do cardiovascular exercise, again, these are seven-year-olds, you actually see a nice big improvement. That's the height of this bar is showing the physical performance improvement that they saw at the end of six months just doing this exercise three times a week. And also, doing resistance training saw almost the exact same size of effect uh, after six months. But interestingly, there's this, the combination of the two exercises saw almost double the improvement in their physical function. And this kind of interestingly points the pack that there are different adaptations that happen after cardiovascular or resistance. If, you, if they did the same things to our body, we'd expect all three of these bars <coughs> to be about the same. So this kind of hopefully paints the picture and puts into context what I'm talking about really is applicable throughout the lifespan. And that's another thing I think is really exciting about exercise. And as I mentioned before, here's my sort of roadmap for my talk. And I'll begin with the bones. So take this skeleton here, and I'm just going to orient you guys. If you zoom in on this person's hip, and then you do a cross-section to the like, this is his thigh bone actually right here, zoomed in. If I zoom in on this part right there, this is what the inside of all of our bones look like. We call this spongy bone because it actually kind of looks like a sponge. And this is normal healthy bone. So now that you know the bone looks like this, we'll take one of those 147-year-olds and put them through that exercise program. What happens with exercise is actually there's a lot of these small little fractures and breaks that happen in the bone as a normal part of, of healthy, healthy damage. But what our body gets really good at is repairing these fractures and actually enhancing the same exact bone that we had before. 
And after six months, our body gets better and better at this recovery process. So this bone strengthening, it's actually a really good thing. This is what prevents the fractures from happening if you might experience a fall. You have a much more resilient uh, bone after you train your body to recover from these small fractures. And also, that's sort of the, that sort of adaptation I demonstrated in the hip. But I also wanted to show you that with resistance exercise, this is uh, an image of someone doing a bicep curl, that if you were just running, you might not get these small fractures in your upper body. But you don't have to walk on your hands to get those adaptations in your upper body. The muscles themselves are actually exerting that same force on the bone that leads to those small fractures. And your body gets extremely good at repairing these. So this is the type of thing to improve bone density, prevent wrist fractures and things in the upper body that you might not get from walking or running alone. And just to summarize, this whole process is just through a series of breaks in recovery. So damage and improvement. And as we exercise more and more, this process becomes more efficient. And moving on to muscles, the way that our muscles work is we contract. That's the way that exercise actually leads to movement of the body's contraction of the muscles. And this muscle contraction itself, that squeezing, actually causes a lot of signals to happen. A lot of messages are sent from our contracting, squeezing muscles to the rest of the body. And it also, during this contraction, also induces small, uh, small tears, very similar to what happens in the bone. But after six months or so, after all of this signaling to cause the repairs, you get a nice increase in size. And that's a good thing. These larger muscles actually <coughs> are what help prevent or the, the larger muscles can then pull on those same bones to strengthen those later in life. And also, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we fuel our exercise, because exercise demands a lot of energy. Typically, the two most common sources that our muscles like to use are carbohydrates and fats, and these are the same carbs and fats that we get from our diet and things like bread and butter. And what happens is, our body, when we eat carbs and fats, our body stores them in what I'll call the energy stores. During exercise, we first try to get all of the carbohydrates released from our energy stores to use for the working muscle, and then we pull on to our fat sources. And I wanted to demonstrate a little analogy. We'll call this Baker the energy store. And at first, on the first day that you go exercise, you know, you start pumping your muscles, and your muscles call to the energy stores in your body, I actually need some energy. I need to use some carbs and fats to fuel this work. At first, the baker, the person guarding your energy source, says, give us a minute. I'm not used to this. This is actually kind of crazy what you're doing running two miles. But after six months, this happy, friendly muscle here gets to know the baker quite well and does the same exact thing, the same two-mile walk or something like that. And when this muscle asks for energy, the baker says, your order's coming right up. I know exactly what to do. I'm used to giving you these carbs and giving you these fats. And this is a way that our body gets much better at burning carbohydrates and fats as we adapt to doing regular exercise. This familiarity of the process between requesting energy from the energy source and the delivery of that energy to the muscle. So to summarize, the muscles become, uh, become stronger through a similar process of micro tears and repair. And also we get a lot better at releasing our carbohydrates and fats from the energy stores throughout our body to fuel the exercise that we do. Now moving on to the fat. This is actually fat that lines all of our entire body. And I'll orient you, this is a little patch of skin with hairs coming out of it. And this yellow stuff is actually what our fat kind of looks like. And if you zoom in even more, this is what three fat cells might look like. This actually looks like this under the microscope. It's pretty boring. And then I'll take the fat on an individual that goes and exercises. And I wanted to emphasize, we don't lose fat cells. We actually just shrink them. It's very hard to actually lose fat cells. And Olivia will talk a little bit more about regeneration in, in her talk. But we're actually just decreasing the size. It takes about eight years for you to lose a fat cell. But you can actually shrink the size of your fat cells pretty quick. <laughs> and then they almost oh. disappear, but they don't. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> and then I also wanted to emphasize, you might have heard of something called spot reduction. And I wanted to say that that actually doesn't exist. 
As I mentioned earlier, all of your energy is stored throughout your body in a big energy storage of pool. Uh, kind of like a big pool of water that stores all of your energy. And trying to spot reduce is like trying to create a hole of water in a big lake. When you scoop out that little piece, the water from everywhere lowers the water level. And that's similar to your stores of energy. You can't make a single hole in this water just like you can't target a specific area for fat loss. And that's just one common thing I wanted to point out. It's not really a way that we can lose fat. And as I mentioned, they shrink. They don't disappear unless I turn the presentation off. <laughs> and uh, spot reduction does not exist. And finally, I'll talk about some of the cool adaptations that happen to the heart and vessels. So as we exercise, you've all felt that uh, sort of increase in heart rate, that pumping of the heart. After six months of exercise, for example, all of that beating actually asks your heart to grow. It's a muscle anyway, just it grows the same way that our other muscles do. And actually, because it's bigger, even though it has, it has to pump out the same amount of blood, if your body size hasn't changed that much, and what happens is your heart rate slows, just like I demonstrated there. And actually, this it can slow kind of a lot. There are some of the athletes, out, like Lance Armstrong, well, He's a bad example, but um, <laughs> there are some really elite athletes that can get their heart rates down to 20 beats per minute when we're usually around 70 or 80. That's almost four times slower, which is actually quite crazy. Uh, so it's a real effect. And another thing that happens is during exercise, we need to get all that energy to our working muscles. And sometimes our vessels kind of feel like this crowded highway, where all the carbs and fats are trying to get to where they need to be. Imagine getting all these carbs and fats to this tiny little vessel, and I'll show you, our body doesn't really like this, and it actually says, what if we could create new lanes in order to get the carbs and fats to places that we wanted to get them to? It turns out, our body does exactly that. We create these new vessels, we actually create new blood vessels in order to get these carbs and fats more efficiently to where they need to be. You can actually grow new vessels, even if those the 70 year olds that I mentioned earlier, it's this, we actually see these same adaptations. And this is one of the ways that exercise reduces blood pressure. Because again, you have around a similar amount of blood trying to get throughout the entire body, but if you have more lanes, there's much less resistance that your blood needs to get through. So this is one way that exercise leads to the reduced blood pressure that we see. And that's a good thing. <laughs> So as I mentioned, we grow in size because it's a muscle too, and it gets blood more efficiently, which causes the reduction in blood pressure. And so finally, I kind of talked a little bit about how we can take some, uh, some of the natural ways to improve our body or, or build our body. And this is just a small piece of the context that we're showing, but I return to this image to show the bones, the muscles, the heart, and the fat, that's all part of the body that we see here. And you're gonna see in the later talks some of the ways that we can get upgrades from nature and from technology. Now I'm going to pass it on to Olivia. Thanks, Max.